Hello guys. Everybody. How's it going? Going great. Nice to see you. Thanks for coming by the studio. Yeah, we are pretty excited this evening uh, to get to join Andy Mattern in his studio at home. He's going to give us a little bit of a tour. He's going to tell us um, about his process a little bit and let us get a, a peek inside where he works and tell us a little bit about the show that is up at Pictura Gallery right now. Um, we've been pretty excited to get to talk to you, Andy, and see your studio um, after seeing your work and get to know more about your process. So we're, we're very excited. Um, for all of you joining at home, I hope you have your beverage and you're ready to do a happy hour here. We've been very mean. We told Andy that he can't have his until we get to the end of the talk. So, <laughs> but I'm Mia Dalglish. I'm one of the co-curators at Pictura Gallery. We have Lisa Woodward here, who's our other co-curator. And of course we have Andy Mattern, who is our wonderful, wonderful photographer who is showing at Pictura Gallery right now. So, um, so Andy, maybe, uh, you know, the show that we have up at the gallery right now, Optimal Conditions, it's a, a combination of three different bodies of work, uh, standard size, average subject, medium distance, and just noticeable difference. And I'm wondering if uh, maybe you could Tell us a little bit about those different bodies of work and um, maybe we'll get to see a sample or two and get start to get a sense of what your studio looks like. Sure, sure, sure. Well, thank you so much, both of you, for having me and thank you to Victoria for having the exhibition. I also will just say a, a quick note to everybody out there that I know this is a bizarre and difficult time and I, I hope that we can just have a quick diversion into the world that we that we hope to have again at some point. So this is my little uh, my little cave here that I spend all of my time in when I am making my work, and I thought I would help by sharing that with the world. If, if that even makes any difference at all, I don't know, but it's one thing that artists can do. We can share our work. So that's that's what we're doing here today. And I, I thought I would start with this position of the camera because this is where I do all of my now online teaching from. Uh, those of us who are in academia and other professions are of course all telecommuting. And so this is, this is what my students see when I'm giving my, um, my lectures and my critiques. However, what they have not yet seen is that this is in fact my storage, which uh, if you pull back the veil, Cool. You can see the, the reality of, of making art for, for, for years. It ends up either in very wonderful public collections and private collections or also in my own storage collection, which is right here. And I pulled out a few pieces from Standard Size, which is the first of the three projects in the exhibition at Victoria. And I thought that I would attempt to quickly explain this and show a couple examples. I'm not sure how well it comes through on the live stream, but I'll, I'll give you the general idea. A few years ago, I found myself just a little bit annoyed by the packages of, of photo paper that surround me in my studio. And it's because they all have example images of the kinds of pictures that you probably should be taking or that maybe you have taken. And I, I decided that I wanted to just get that out of my immediate field of view. So I initially just would kind of carve off the pictures and cover up all the text with tape. I have a very elaborate tape collection. And I realized in the process of doing that that I was inadvertently making these compositions, which I then began to photograph. and make prints of and that's what you're seeing uh, behind me here. So each print is an actual size photographic replica of the box that I had transformed with paper and uh, with, with tape and, and cutting. Uh, and that project uh, has, has been exhibited uh, in, in New York and elsewhere and is currently a part of the show at, at Pictura. So I don't know, should I, should I, um, should I pause for your questions? <laughs> Let's see. Um, well, it's funny because, you know, as a fellow photographer used to be, yeah, I do have such this emotional attachment to the photo boxes, you know, and going and picking up those, those boxes that have the images in it. And um, I love the, yeah, kind of the cheekiness of taking away the, the image that we should all strive for. Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, I think that that's really the conceptual thrust of the work, and it's something that I return to a lot in my practice. It's about finding new opportunities in the materials and critiquing the conventions that we are so familiar with, whatever that means. It can still mean making conventional photographs, but they are your own conventions. That's what I always hope for. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Let's see, let's see if we have, um, I don't think we have any uh, questions yet from the audience, but let's go on to the next station. Um, for those of you who are just joining us, uh, Andy Mattern is taking us, look at this, this is awesome. Uh, he's wheeling us through his studio space uh, and he's giving us a description of the different uh, work that is in his current exhibition at Victoria Gallery. And uh, yeah, so let's hear about the next body of work. Um, all right. Well, um, you know, originally when I met Lisa and Mia at the Museum of Photography Portfolio Review in Denver, this was the project that I that I was um, what I was what I was promoting at the time, and it was it was their idea to create an exhibition that paired this with the first series standard size that we saw, and later the show idea developed further, and we'll, we'll get into that. But what you're seeing behind me here are actually unpublished new pieces from that series that I had been making new prints to go into a portfolio box to take to PhotoFest Houston, but unfortunately session three was canceled. Yeah, so they remain here on my studio wall. But to give a little bit of explanation for these, they come out of uh, a similar impulse to standard size where I'm looking at existing materials in the medium and manipulating them in some way. In this case, it's gonna be kind of difficult, especially for those of you who've never seen these in person to look at this and think, well, is that even photography? What are we talking about? And it, it is, I, I assure you, and yet it is not as well. These are, these are images, they're digital images that I make of little paper dials. They are, they're, they're called exposure dials. They're little cards from the 50s and 60s and 70s and, and a little bit later than that that were used for cameras that didn't have internal uh, components to, to gauge exposure and other, and other uh, features that you, that you need to make a picture. So you would use this little piece of paper and you would figure out, you know, what, do you, what does the camera need? And then you would dial those into the camera and make your photograph. So I've, I've photographed those dials and then I have removed the, the instructions and the numbers and also the suggestion pictures from these devices because they also will have a little description and an image that shows you, well, if you get it right, this is, this is what you might get. And those things I, I have, I have um, obscured, but in each piece, I leave a single word in its original location. And I'm sure that that's not visible here. And I don't know that I'll be able to, to show it. Um, but each, each one shows just a, a single word. So like this piece here, it says effective. That's an, a new one. This one I'm really excited about. It says polarizing. And I, I love how these, these words can be a springboard for interpretation. They kind of point to the, the priorities in the medium again. And at the same time, they, they're, they're these little haikus. They can be paired in different ways. They can be different parts of speech. And um, it, it's just a way of kind of reinterpreting these, these basic constituent parts that we're used to as photographers. So Andy, when you started making them, you know, you, you say you, you photographed them, correct? And then you take them into um, Photoshop and you start erasing information um, and, I mean, how, what was that process when you were first beginning? Because I know now you've kind of found your groove with this of, of the series, but how did you kind of zero in on, on where you are now? Yeah, thank you. It's a, it's, a, it's a wonderful question. I mean, I think that art making involves these different discrete steps. And the first step is not knowing. And I think that's such an important step. It's something that is really uncomfortable but it's something you have to learn how to be okay with so that you can get to the next steps. So initially for me, it was not knowing what these things even were, and then not really being able to see them in their current form. And so as I, I, I photographed them initially, and that's just my knee jerk impulse for everything that interests me, like, okay, I'm gonna photograph it. But then oftentimes the image of the thing is not quite enough or it doesn't really to say what I wanted to say. And so it needs to have some further context or, or development. And in the case of these photographs, I, I made the image of these things and it's just so much text and all these numbers and all this kind of input, input, input. And I, I felt like I couldn't see them until I removed that. 
And my, my first step was to, well, at that point, when I started removing things, it was to remove everything. And when I removed everything, I thought, okay, well, but now I'm just kind of doing the same thing that I was doing where I was removing everything. And so is there a way to just dial it back slightly and leave something so that it starts to speak a new language? Yeah, I think that's one of the things that I love so much about it is that uh, you've left just enough indication, you know, when you're looking at the image that you get the sense that, okay, this is supposed to be a tool of measurement. Um, and then, but, but you've taken away, you know, any, any actual numerical increments. So there's nothing to gauge the thing that you're measuring against. Like it doesn't, so when, you know, and you've used words like desire, so it's, it's like, oh, this is to measure desire or, you know, appropriate. That's one of my favorite ones. Um, so I, yeah, I love the idea of being able to measure these very nebulous things, but then kind of the humor of uh, not even knowing what the beginning or end of it is. Yeah, well, I, 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 that's important to me too, that you said humor, because it, it, it is fairly dry, fairly minimal, and yet I, I want there to be this little injection of life, and that is in the form of dry humor, but also in terms of the poetry that's embedded in them. And I think that, again, that kind of circles back to and speaks to what photography is known to do, or what it's believed to do, and of course it's, it's problematic, and that's the idea that the photograph is, is, is true, and that it's, it, it's able to kind of control its environment. Like, you point the camera at the thing, and you can organize what you want from the thing. And I, I think that questioning that is important for photographers so that we can then jujitsu it into, um, you know, maybe something, maybe something else. Yeah, yeah. Did I have a little yeah. question for you? Yeah. Since it's such a privilege to get to see inside, you know, someone's working space. Um, and we're looking here at your test strips. What oh, right. are you no, no, this is, no one sees the test strips. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. test strips. Sees what them. are you gauging here? What are you judging? Uh, well, so I, you know, these are subtle changes, but it's something that I learned when I did color printing in the darkroom in, in college, where, you know, the color that you get out of the printer is maybe not the color that you want, and maybe it's not even the color that you see on the screen. And in the color darkroom, there was a way to, dial in more magenta or more yellow, and then you can shift things in one direction or another. So initially I make a test strip and I just, I look at it and decide if, if it is too dark or too light or too red or too cyan, and I make those adjustments. So it, again, I don't know if it's gonna really come up um, up here, but I make little notations on them. You know, I, I have little like, okay, plus highlights and plus blue, and that, so they, then they, they iterate and I, I leave them up so that I can, see where I've been before I make the, the final the final print. So is the, the printing is a big part of the craft for you as well then? Absolutely, absolutely. And it always has been. You know, I think that that's something that people maybe don't realize about digital photography because it's so familiar and so immediate uh, that it, like the darkroom, it's still a physical process at the, at the end of the day. Or at least it is for me and for a lot of photographers. So there is a craft, there is a visuality to it, there's a materiality to it, you know, like th this particular paper that I use is it's, it's, it's for its surface and it's for its color qualities, uh, which we'll get to talk more about paper momentarily. Um, but yeah, definitely, it's very much a craft uh, that, I, that I enjoy from, you know, start to finish. So we have some questions coming in. Oh, wow. Yes, yeah, so Santiago, who is four, okay. four years old, would yeah. love to know if you have a favorite photograph. <laughs> uh, do I remember Santi from the from the kid workshop? I, I think, think I do. Santi, yeah. I think we had we had some fun that day. Yeah. Um, well, Santi, I, I I think that you know picking a favorite piece of art is kind of like picking your favorite child. It's something that is really not possible because you know we 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 love all of our babies, um, and yet uh, I I really tend to be excited about the, the newest one that I have made. And that is you know, quickly replaced. And that, that rule does not apply to children. So that's kind of a problematic metaphor. But uh, the, the, the newest piece is generally the one that I'm, that I'm most attentive to. And I think maybe that is an appropriate metaphor. But uh, actually, I'll, I'll, show you, I'll show you this one. Um, well, let's see here. Get back to this. This piece. Um, Santi, this is the piece called effective, and oh. that, that word means that something is, it's doing a good job, you know, it's, it's effective. 
And this, this particular dial, the original piece was for aerial photography. And I'm really excited about how it has all these different little areas and regions and it feels even more technical and assertive than some of the others. And that's why I chose that word. So for right now, Santi, it's this one. Ah, that, that goes, thank you. That, that, is, a, that is a great uh, explanation. That kind of goes into the next question, which was um, people are wondering how you decide which word you keep on the photograph. Yeah, so. yeah. Um, so I, I'll, I'll say uh, briefly that I agonize over that, over that decision because I've never included language in my work, uh, not in the last you know, thing to do. It is, it is because language has so many connotations and it's, 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 it's specific in some ways and obviously which language it is even right out of the gate changes things because you may or may not be an English speaker or an English reader. Um, so setting those things aside, my, my, my method for myself was to pick words that were in some way connected to photography. And if that wasn't you know, exactly possible, then at least it needed to be a word that could function as different parts of speech. So it can be maybe a noun and a verb, you know, like, um, like, like subject is also to subject. Both of those things can those can function differently in different sentences. So I just I didn't want to pick a word that only had one one immediate connotation. I wanted it to be interpretable. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Well, you did a great job of choosing lots of interesting ones. Thank you. <laughs> well, should we let's see? Should we move on to another part of your studio? Sure. Well, I'll I'll take you over here, and Mia, you can tell us where, what we're doing. Wonderful. So for those of you just joining us, um, I'm here with Lisa Woodward, um, one of the other co-curators at Pictura Gallery, and we are very lucky to be with Andy Mattern in his studio, getting a sneak peek at his work process and getting to hear about how he creates the the work that's in the exhibition that we have right now up the gallery which is called optimal conditions and he's just been telling us a little bit about the different uh three projects that are included in that exhibition and uh yeah so here we are in your studio and tell us where we are now um, well, this is kind of a pit stop on, on the tour. So in, in the tour, we're looking at the three different bodies of work that are in the exhibition that you mentioned. And I thought while we are here, I will show you something that's currently brewing. And this is in the spirit of the, of the not knowing that I was talking about before. I, I don't know what this is and I don't know if it will be anything, but I'm having a great time uh, working with it. I, I borrowed this Macintosh Classic, which is an old computer from the mid 80s from a friend of mine um, at, at school, because I, I, I used to have this computer when I was a kid. This was, this was my machine. I remember putting the disc into it and it goes ka-chunk and it's in there. You know, it's, oh, a, yeah. it's a different kind of experience than how we compute these days with our, with our thumbs. So I, I decided I wanted to just boot it up and see if it worked. And it turns out that it needed some repairs. And so I have, I have stripped it apart and I learned some funny things like the, the, the main component in the computer that makes the whole thing go, the logic board. It turns out, stay with me, that these things um, break down and have problems and you can fix them in these old machines by putting them in the dishwasher. No. This is the thing. This is the real thing. <laughs> Uh, I, and I know as I'm saying that, I should remind everyone, you know, don't try this at home with your normal electronics. <laughs> can, say, can I put my phone in the keep, dishwasher? Keep your phone out of the dishwasher. Oh, okay. I, I have actually accidentally washed my phone one day. I came home from the gym and it was still in my shorts and I threw it in the, anyway. So these things happen. But uh, for, when it comes to the, the Macintosh Classic Logic Board, apparently it can be uh, washed in that way. I took a slightly more conservative approach and I used Q-tips and 91% isopropyl alcohol. And after doing that and then putting everything back together, it works. Wow. So I'm gonna boot it up here and just talk about this for a couple more moments. What, what I initially was planning on doing with this was getting a, a, a disc of the old drawing program that I used when I was a kid. And it was, it was invented by um, a, a guy named Craig Hickman, who uh, was a professor at the University of Oregon. 
And I didn't know that until later when I went to the University of Oregon for a year as an exchange student, and he turned out to be my digital arts instructor. So I got to be a fanboy in his class saying, I was a kid, I used kid pics. And, I did too. Uh, yeah. Oh, you, you, you use kid pics too? Yes. Awesome. Yeah. So kid pics, it's, it's a really simple program. It's, a, it's a just, you know, blocks and, and you draw shapes or whatever. And um, I, I always loved that program. So I thought I would figure out a way to, to run it. And uh, I have stripped this whole thing down and put it all back together with the purpose of being able to run kid pics. And I miraculously found a copy of the original software on eBay and bought it and I've made my very first kid pics file which is currently my Facebook banner so if you look at my Facebook banner that's what I did in kid pics and uh, the first time it loaded I was like oh well I gotta do something so this is what I'm gonna do and from there I, I think I may be photographing this screen and, and making some other patterns and things from the graphics but we'll, we'll see. Ah oh, interesting. You know, I have to say my first experiences on a computer was playing Oregon Trail. Oh yeah, oh yeah, big time. We're, we're gonna get some, we're gonna get some fan questions from that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I played Oregon Trail. Um, my brother Steven played uh, Load Runner on this machine, which is a very fun game where you shoot bricks and jump around. So yeah, there's a lot of fun memories with these machines and, and they have an aesthetic to them that I'm interested in, in um, mining. Yeah, so, so, oh, yes, a couple of people are saying great your patience. Your level of patience is, uh, as you're working with these programs. I'm sorry, was that a question? Do you have to recalibrate your patience as you sort of wait for the old computer? Oh, yeah, absolutely. And, and I think it's actually kind of fun. And, and that's something that I, I've been excited about with, with playing with this machine. It's taken me two months to figure out all the problems with the logic board and the RAM and the analog board and the disk drive and the operating system. I've reinstalled it from scratch. In addition to the KidPix um, program, I, I actually found an original set of Apple system disks. This is uh, Apple OS 7. So you know, for everybody out there using Catalina or whatever it is, that's OS 10 point something. This is OS 7, which is um, all black and white, very old on this machine very, very slow. And finally, after, after these couple of months that I've been playing with this thing, it's finally able to run KidPix and KidPix arrived two days ago. Um, so yeah, there's definitely patience because if I was just demanding that I could use KidPix right away, I, I would not be able to. <laughs> wow, wow, very nice. Oh yes, well we have people uh, writing in saying that they love uh, kids picks and they also like Oregon Trail. <laughs> nice, nice. Well, um, bir birds of birds of a feather. Yeah, that's right. Oh well, let's see. Should we should we go on to your next area of your studio? Sure. Wonderful. Uh, for those of you who are just joining in to this lovely happy hour that we're having, um, cheers. Cheers, by the way. Uh, we're here with Andy Mattern. Uh, he has the, his current exhibit is up at Pictura Gallery. It's called Optimal Conditions. I'm here with my co-curator, Lisa, or I'm her co-curator, you know, whatever. <laughs> and, uh, and we're here with Andy Mattern and he is being kind enough to show us his studio and let us know about his work. And uh, so let's come come back to the studio. And yeah, t I see a, a, a bright blue light. Tell us yes. about that. I, I, I hope you can all still hear me okay and maybe see something of what I'm doing here. This is going to be a, an, an imprecise demonstration. So you'll have to stop by Picture Gallery in order to really see it or look at my website where I've got some installation images of, that, of this new project. This is the third of the three projects in the exhibition, and it came about because it was something I was working on at that time when I met Lisa and Mia, and I hadn't shown it yet, and I was, I was excited about a way to integrate it into this conversation of the other projects. It, it kind of naturally fit because it's also about the same thing. It's about the materials of photography. It's about the thing that we now use more than anything in, uh, in the physicalizing of our prints, and that's inkjet paper. So rather than focusing on you know, these, these boxes and being uh, ir irritated by the branding of them, I decided that I wanted to delve into the paper itself. And it's 
a, a, a little known phenomenon of this paper that it contains what's called optical brightening agents, which is a dye that makes it look whiter to our eyes. And, and yet it's, it's kind of out, the jury is out about whether or not that's a problem for the paper for its longevity. And so my, my project with this paper is to compare all of these different brands of, of paper and display them under ultraviolet light because the ultraviolet light excites the dye and it reveals which paper has it and which paper doesn't. So the, these are just different pieces of, of paper and I've got my, my tiny UV light here, which uh, again, I know is probably difficult to really, to, to really see. Uh, but it just gives you kind of a, a hint at, at what happens in the show. It's a the piece is arranged as as clusters of paper by by the brand. So each brand will have like six or eight or ten different kinds of paper, and then within those they'll have different amounts of this dye in them. So when they're all displayed together, they kind of reveal their own identities and and have a little conversation with each other. Yeah, so when, when you're looking at it on the wall, it's really interesting because there are these tiles, which Andy is holding right now. It looks just like a white piece of paper. Yeah, exactly, um, before you put the blue light on it. And then we you know, put them up on the wall. Um, and then when you, when you turn the black light on, suddenly all the different tiles have sort of a different tonality to them. And as you guys can see, there's kind of this blue glow. Um, and in the gallery, when you can see all the pieces of paper next to each other, each piece of the paper has kind of a different bluish glow to it. So suddenly you feel like you're looking at this wall that has all these different kind of tones of blue and white on it, uh, which is such an interesting thing when you're going from thinking, you know, these are just all regular pieces of white paper and then suddenly you start to see all these tonal differences and it has this kind of glow to it too it's it's really mesmerizing yeah i mean i was i was really interested in, in just trying to again sort of see below the surface you know like with standard size i want to see past the branding and with average subject medium distance i want to see past the instructions and with this i want to see past the veneer you know, like this is the shiny paper and they've got the metallic one and they've got the one with the little tooth on it and they've got all the kinds of things. And yet like what's behind that and what do we do with that? Uh, so that, that's what really I was trying to, trying to play with in that piece. Yeah, you know, there's two things I found especially interesting about that work. Just, just from a visual perspective, I, I love, you know, that you're taking something, just visually you're taking these pieces of white paper that when you look at under a normal circumstance you think they just look all the same and i love how uh with this installation you're getting the viewer to take the time to see that well at, you know as it's called there's like just a noticeable difference so suddenly you know it's like the color white there's so many colors in that and you're suddenly seeing all the variations and tonalities on this thing that looks the same you know, but that it's so different. Um, so that that's one thing I love visually, but then just conceptually, I think it's it's really interesting because there's so many things that we can look at in our everyday lives where there's a lot that kind of goes into the making of the thing. You know, like I could even just say my cell phone. You know, it's it's this shiny, lovely object that I love that kind of optimizes lots of things for me and my experience. And there's so much going on behind the scenes in terms of what has gone into making this object that I'm not aware of the repercussions that it has or how really the final effect it has on me. Um, and and I think that this uh, this body of work kind of again looks at that in a it's not meant to be heavy, but it, it kind of pokes the door open for you to think about those things. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, I hope so. And, and like, again, for me, it's, a, it's about playing with these materials, but it's also about just creating my own rules. And I, I think that that's something that, that artists get to do, but it's something that, that we all can do in our, in our lives, you know, that I, I, I remember just even being a kid and, and being given certain toys, like we had 
you know, Legos and we had other toys like that. Like there was something called constructs, which I'm now very much dating myself with the Mac classic and talking about constructs, but these are, these are buildable tools. These are things that you can construct things out of. And you know, on the box, it has like a car or whatever. And I always wanted to make stuff that was never on the box. I, I, I would make myself weird headdresses and you know, appendage um, uh, uh, things. And uh, so I think that that's what kids do naturally. And uh, I, I'd like to extend that to some, some degree in, in my practice that when I get something, I don't want to be lulled by what it's telling me that it can do. I want to be kind of aware enough of what is what is here to find something else. Mm. Mm -hmm. yeah. The idea of making your own rules. I think a lot of photographers are drawn to the medium because it has its own set of rules. <laughs> uh, that you can sort of safely jump into and begin abiding by the rules, um, but you're making it more interesting, kind of pushing on them a little. Um, I also, I think of you a little bit as a multidisciplinary artist. I wonder how you see yourself. I mean, your subject matter, you're talking very much talking about all the things that are internal to the field of photography, um, but kind of pushing in the little sculptural direction. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, mean, I, I, I think it's, a, it's, a, it's an important point to, to talk about because, you know, in the tradition of, of, of photography, there, there are these kind of established pillars of you know, portraiture and landscape and still life. And I think that that's true for, for other media as well. Um, I was trained in a, in a program that was really cross boundary oriented. And um, as an undergrad, we were encouraged to try everything, do everything. And then even in grad school, although we taught in certain areas, there was always this openness about you know, making the work that you need to make because you need to make that work, not because you're a painter or because you're a photographer. So I, I identify with the moniker of photographer. I've, I've been in it for uh, most of my life. And yet, honestly, I'm still a little bit uncomfortable with that label, you know, because I think it means different things to different people, but that, so too with being an artist. So I, I definitely have a kinship with sculpture. I definitely have a kinship with painting. And, and yet um, I, I, I would not feel comfortable calling myself either a sculptor or a painter. So I, I think that it, it, you know, the, the moniker of artist is the, is, the most, um, is the most malleable and it's the one that I aspire to at least. Yeah, yeah, I could see that. Well, Andy, I feel like you deserve to partake in this happy hour, finally. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. That brings us to position uh, four or five or whatever it is by this time. Uh, for, oh, cheers, cheers. cheers. I, I, would, I would clink my screen, but let's be aware of our keyboards, okay? Good point, good point, <laughs> cheers. Mm, for everyone who tuned in, thanks for um, coming with us into Andy's studio. Yeah, for, for all of you joining us, this has been um, a, a lovely tour of the, the studio of Andy Mattern, and getting to know a little bit about his process and the the pieces that are in his solo show right now at Pictura Gallery. Um, Andy, it's it's so lovely to see your workspace and and yeah, hear a little bit more about what goes into your thought process and, and how you make these pieces. Well, thank you all for coming, and thank you, uh, Mia and Lisa, for arranging this. Um, also, just for the opportunity to get out of my pajamas. Uh, you know, I, 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 I'm, wearing, I'm wearing normal clothes below the, the line here, so it's, it's good, and I, I think that we all kind of have to do this. You know, we have to keep a schedule, and we have to keep our minds um, focused on, on what's important to us, and, and also, like, take it easy, you know? Yeah. I, I think that that's so important for us right now, and, and for me, that actually means being down here and playing with my funny old computer for maybe no reason, you know? And yeah. I, yeah. I think we all need that, that permission right now to, to do what we need to do and take care of our families and, and just hope for better days. So um, yeah. thank you for giving me the opportunity to be optimistic. <laughs> Likewise. I, I must be honest and say that this is probably uh, the only time I have really truly been out of pajamas and <laughs> 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 you know, I've, I've actually heard that sales of regular pants have gone down. I believe it. Who needs them? 
Um, anyway, just to let you all out there know, uh, tomorrow morning we have a pretty fun event that is also linked to Andy's work. So tomorrow, Saturday 11th at 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, and this time it's going to be on Pictura Gallery's um, Instagram Live. Our creative director at the FAR Center, um, Daniela, her and her four-year-old are going to be creating some compositions based on Andy's work. So basically they have cut out some pieces of paper and things like that so that this the second body of work that he told us about where he's making kind of these these dials and switches that you can you can measure things with uh they're going to make their own and they'll be live streaming that tomorrow at 11 a.m i think there are some guides that people can yeah. Um, print out, cut out shapes of their own, and kids or kids at heart or stir crazy adults can also make their own <laughs> compositions. I had the intention of making one, and I have no colored paper, so I was using post it notes, like cutting one shape out of a post it note, and it was slow going. Um, but I still I have hopes for joining, so it's not at 10 at 11? Uh, 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time through Instagram. So join us for that. It should be really lovely. Um, to all of you at home, cheers. Thank you for joining us. Please stay healthy, stay safe. Uh, we miss you all. <laughs> um, thank you, Andy. This has brought a nice little bit of light to, to our week. So. Cheers, all right. Well, thank you all so much. We'll see you. We'll see you soon. All right. Bye. Cheers. Bye.